Well, here we are in the Amstel Kring at Christmas time again. Uh, who's welcome to Aspect Art. Um, one reason I always like to come here at Christmas time is that you, in fact, uh, present Christmas, uh, maybe as it was celebrated by the Catholics in the 17th century in their hidden church. Could you tell us a little about what Christmas might have been like uh, in the 17th century, Catholic? Churches, homes. Yeah, Catholic, uh, Catholics are very much interested always in Christmas. Christmas is one of the major celebrations, the second one after Easter. It, of course, Easter is more important because um, Christ has risen from the dead, but uh, Christmas is about Christ who has become human. So it's, it's the God who has deemed himself fit to become a human, to be born from a woman into this world. So for the, for the Christians and the Catholics in particular, this is a very important event. And I'm sure that in the 17th century, uh, even if in these little attic churches, there would be beautiful celebrations. They would use their best garments, they would use the best silver they had, and made really a spectacular church mass out of it. So I think even there's always been an important festival, but even in the 17th century, people would have taken a lot of effort, a lot of money if they had it, to make it into something really special. So we know that in the 17th, 18th century, the church would be decorated with garlands. So what we try to achieve nowadays, we have done that for a couple of years now, and we try to even improve it year by year to make this even look more spectacular, more beautiful, because we know that they would have taken a lot of energy and a lot of um, effort in it to make it a really exciting uh, Christmas celebration. So that's what we are trying to show to the public who comes to my museum during Christmas time. Now the Catholics uh, through the centuries really composed the, a lot of music for Christmas, yeah. uh, a lot of yeah. religious music. How was it in the 17th century? Did the, the, the Calvinists in any way equal that or, or was it there no inclination and the Catholics just kind of carry on that tradition? Yeah, the Catholics carried on that tradition. We know it's not so very well known, but there was a lot of music being written for these churches in the 17th, 18th century. And every year uh, we try to do something special with our Christmas nightmares in this museum. If we possible can, we try to find 17th or 18th century masses which were composed for Christmas to perform in this little church because we think that's one of our obligations because we want to be um, do a lot of, of work and scholarly work on that period, 17th, 18th century. And so we try to do a little bit of effort to, to also perform this kind of music uh, during Christmas time in this little church. We know there's been quite a tradition, but of course there was a lot of music being written in the 17th, 18th century. You know, all these famous Baroque composers, they made a lot of music for every occasion, so they just did it. So if you say, oh, let's have an, a new Mass, people would write a Mass for Christmas. No problem. And it would be performed, and next year they would have another Mass. Now, in the 17th century, of course, um, in the 16th century, uh, the iconoclast brought about a kind of um, a change in the in the manner that the general population viewed the saints, viewed yeah. uh, Maria. There was a kind of secularization of Maria as opposed to being holy. She was now the mother of God and yeah. it was more secular. How did it go on with the Catholics in that form? Of course, the Catholics didn't uh, change anything. Of course, we know now about the relic show in the Nieuwe Kerk and in Utrecht that the relics became a little bit more suspicious. But um, the fact that Mary was still considered to be the mother of God made her even for Protestants still a very special woman. And the Catholics in particular, because they, they made one of their uh, most important points during the, Reform the Contra-Reformation is to make, to emphasize the importance of, of Mary as 
part of the salvation of every Catholic. So in Catholic Church, of course, even in Amsterdam or outside of Amsterdam, Mary was still being worshipped as almost a divinity. And for the Protestants, she also was still a very important person to, to address. But it's, of course, in art you see that several subjects which were normal in the time before the Reformation, uh, you see that after the Reformation, during the Contra Reformation, I think uh, half all the paintings being made have some kind of reference to, to Mary. So still, she's very, very important. I did notice, however, when we were in the Kunsthal, there was a, a painting of Maria as you walk into the first, and she was, well, she could have almost been mistaken for a Hausfrau yeah. here in Holland. Uh, yeah. Was this more of the Protestant view? We don't know it's much more the Protestant view, but it's, it's typical that even, we also have some paintings in this museum where you show, where you can see Mary in a not a very traditional way being um, uh, painted. Uh, she becomes much more of a person you can relate to because, of course, all these paintings, if you see by Raphael or other painters, Mary is always a typical, a, a typical person, a typical way of representing her. In the 17th century in the Netherlands, you see that she's going to be represented in a more human way, a more recognizable way, much more according to, um, to thinking, oh, Mary was a woman that age, and she should have been that age when that happened, so she should not be represented as a very young woman, but more in a woman as she would have been in her 50s or something. So they become much more realistic about showing Mary. It's, it's a nice change, but it's not something which really lasts very long. You see it in the Netherlands during a short period of time, just by certain artists, and it's, it's, it's peculiar, yeah. It's nice also. Now here in your museum every year you have a crash. Uh, yeah. Was that still popular with the Protestants or was it just again something that had to do with the Catholics? Yeah, the way we now see crashes is of course typical of the 19th century. Of course, uh, St. Francis is the first one who started to make a crash somewhere in the 12th century or 11th or the 13th century and he made it with real animals and then it became a tradition, especially in Italy and it came over to the, to the northern part of, the, of, the, of Europe. But it was not a very ordinary thing to have. That's not until the, the, the 19th century. But it's always, the crash has always been a typical Catholic thing. And I don't think any uh, Protestant household before the Second World War would have a crash displayed in their house. So it was typical of something which the Catholics would do. But um, the Catholics wouldn't have Christmas trees. That was typical Protestant. So you see that after the Second World War, these things become mixed. And now even Protestant families will have a crash, and all the Catholics also have trees. So it's, uh, it has changed for the better now. Now, oftentimes, uh, we, we have a tendency to think of uh, Holland having always celebrated Christmas. Now, they have Sinterklaas, yeah. which... I'm not sure of the of the chronology here, but was Sinterklaas something that was added to the Dutch year to supplant Christmas, or was no. it in fact also part of Christmas? And how does that work here in Holland in the 17th, 18th, 19th century? I think it's two different things. Um, because now we think about, uh, I don't think... Christmas was, of course, a celebration, but not with, with gifts like we know it now, especially from uh, the influence from uh, from the United States, where Christmas has become a, a very much the same thing as, as St. Nicholas has, was always for us. We know that the tradition of St. Nicholas is a very old tradition of, of, of all the things, the traditions we have, are from the 15th and 16th century. So even when the Reformation came in Amsterdam, and um, Amsterdam, of course, was a city dedicated to St. Nicholas, uh, from that moment onwards, uh, there were all kinds of laws banning all the superstition around St. Nicholas, but in, in, in reality, people were so um, close to this celebration of St. Nicholas that they kept going on with it, and the Dutch didn't, they never liked laws in that, that respect, so even the Protestant laws were disobeyed, and everybody would still celebrate uh, St. Nicholas, and that has never really changed, so it was not just a Catholic celebration, it became also a very popular celebration. So Christmas and uh, St. Nicholas, I don't think they did have anything to do with each other. They were just two typical uh, celebrations, which, which one was more uh, 
religious-like and the other one was more folk-like. And nowadays, of course, we uh, both connect, uh, both celebrations are connected with, with gifts. And St. Nicholas was almost taken over by Christmas, but uh, fortunately the tradition is now getting more stronger, I think because of the European Union or whatever. But it's, it's going to be uh, two separate entities, and I hope it will remain separate entities, but the problem is they are so close together, so they're all, all being uh, celebrated in the uh, month of December. Well, in fact, maybe much of it has to do with today, which is the 21st of December, which is the winter solstice, also, which yeah. goes back to the time of the pagan period, much like the Christmas tree might yeah, be, yeah, and yeah. Uh, other such tree worship with the, the Celtic uh, population. Not, it has got nothing to do with St. Nicholas because with St. Nicholas we celebrate his, uh, his, the day of his death because that's the day he went to heaven and he's reborn. So that's the, the date which has always been celebrated as St. Nicholas Day. But Christmas, of course, has everything to do with uh, the, the changing of the seasons and that after uh, the days become uh, shorter and it's getting colder, then suddenly the days are getting longer by the 21st of December and Christ is a symbol of the sun and of the new life. So they have all connected all these traditions with the birth of Christ because we all, birth of Christ, because we all know, we have no idea at which date he was born. It could have been the 2nd of, of, of June or the 21st of, of October. We have no idea what his, what his day of birth was, but they chose a moment which was symbolic for people, and that was the turn of winter. And of course, the Catholic Church has, with, with Charles, Charlemagne, everything has been very much being given form in Italy and in Germany. And all these symbols of pagan uh, traditions were taken over by the Catholic Church, like they took over the temples in Rome. And they, they took all these symbols, which people would understand, and create a new religion out of it. I think Christian religion also has a lot to do with all the tradition. It's about religion as people first knew it in, 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 in a million years ago or something. So it's just a very uh, human way of looking to, to God and taking all the symbols together to make it and transform it into something we can use and we can believe in. Yeah. Now Christmas has a lot to do with um, the God up in heaven sending his son down to earth yeah. with the help of a ghost. Uh, yeah. Um, now we know that much that preceded Christianity was a monotheistic uh, Hebrew religion, which mm -hmm. has some precedent, as we see in this exhibition in Leiden of the uh, Pharaoh, yeah. that yeah. Uh, that was yeah. a brief form of monotheistic uh, yeah. belief even in the uh, Egyptian yeah. uh, 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 chronology. So. How were these three entities tied together at Christmas? And what was going on there with maybe the shepherds and the wise men and all these other guys? Ooh, that's a difficult question. Um, yeah, the idea of the three gods being one god, of course, is something Catholic religion has, I think, produced, if you can say that way. Uh, you have got the Father, of course, who is the almighty uh, creator. He sent his son, so he sent uh, part of himself to be God in this world, but also be human and to suffer as a human, but also show that there's life after life on earth, so that you have something to prepare yourself for. And so he's the, the word, as we say. He is the one who went to earth and who talked to people. He was the word. And then you have the spirit, who, uh, divine spirit, who enlightens everybody. So it's three parts of the divine nature who are represented in three different personalities, you could say, but they still belong to the one, one entity, which is God. So it's, very, uh, it's difficult to explain. It's like St. Augustine already said, it's just as hard to understand the, 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 the structure of the, the Trinity than you can put all the water of the, of the, of the seas in one little, uh, little hole. It's, you, can, it's, you can't understand it. It's impossible to, to understand it, but it's, it's true. Um, but then you have, of course, uh, the fact that Christ was born in a stable. There was no room for him in a, in the uh, in the inn. Is also showing that he is a that it's difficult to be a human 
and that uh, you can be turned down by everybody and uh, that even if he was a god and he was a king and everything that people still didn't recognize it and he had to to satisfy himself with the most humble circumstances and of course the shepherds in the um, in the biblical times were kind of outcasts and they were the first ones to hear about Christ being born so they were also showing that he was not born for the kings but he was born for the, the just the ordinary and simple people and the kings as we see them of course um, are not described as kings in the bible they're as uh, magicians or as uh, wise people and they also represent that uh, uh, that also people with knowledge would recognize the son of god if he was there so you have everybody you have the the rich and the the wise and you have the simple and the uh, not wise people who have not uh, all this uh, wisdom behind them but they just see it and they believe it so they don't need scientific proof that he is god they they heard about it and they came and they saw it so it's very human you could say and of course these events have been they have not actually taken place at least i don't think so i think they stand for something they are symbols they're not i don't think christ was born in this in this stable but he was born under simple circumstances but of course people need symbols especially in that time we are not used to symbols anymore uh, we know that in 70 80 70 people would understand much more symbols than we do and even in in, in in christian early christian time people were living by symbols and they needed symbols uh, common truth you could say which they could um, feel close to which you could understand kind of of, 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 of of speech which we have lost but they were very inclined to, to, to adhere to. So that's why the shepherds are there, that's why the, the magicians are there, that's why there's a stable, that's why there's a virgin to show that, that it's, it's purity, that God is pure and he cannot be uh, um, uh, taken by sin. So there's all kind of symbols, they work to show what a wonderful event has taken place. We're finding ourselves now in the 21st century. How would you describe the state of our belief as we come to Christmas? Oh, that's a, also a difficult question. Um, we always see that a lot of people have a special feeling about Christmas and I think that feeling, I hope it will never go away because I think religion is something beautiful, it's something special and a lot of people don't have a religion but they still have the need for symbolism, for something special, to have something which they can um, feel close to and we notice that a lot of people and even not Christian or not believers come to, to this museum during Christmas because they see the symbols and they see the atmosphere and they see something there is something special. So uh, I think the, all the changes of the 60s where everybody, of course, didn't want to do, have to do anything with religion because, of course, religion is a beautiful thing, but a lot of things around religion are things you can, I, I, I wouldn't like. Uh, I, I'm, I'm fortunate that I didn't have anything to do with all the um, things the Catholics have done in the past centuries because there have been sometimes even terrible things and terrible attitudes and everything. Now it's much more pure and the new generation, they don't uh, have this um, legacy of all these terrible things. And now they come with a very close and open mind to see from what is this and what is there in it which could be good for us, which could be good for my spirit or could be good for my development. They don't have to be Catholics, but at least they could understand that perhaps there's something special going on and that we're part of a bigger thing. And I think the younger generation is much more open to it now than uh, 20 years ago. I don't, I'm not pleading to people to become Catholics, but I think that people should be open to everything and they should try to, to understand why things have been going on in the past and which were the deeper motives behind it and not just say, oh, religion stinks, I don't want to do anything to do with it because it's just bullshit. Perhaps, I don't know, but there's also a lot of good in it. I think there's a lot of uh, human values being 
shown, in, in, but even perhaps a little bit hidden, but being shown inside of, of this, this message. I think, unfortunately, a lot of it got contaminated by the priesthood or yeah. the, the bureaucracy of the church itself by yeah. making it more important than the message in many ways. Well, Hus, thank you very much for uh, sharing the Catholic view of Christmas and the Amstelkring, which is a beautiful little museum that everyone should visit maybe during this holiday season. Hope so. Thanks again for being here. You're welcome. Thank you for coming here and have a nice Christmas. Same to you. Yeah.